scope rule is a very important concept in any programming language. So, Java is no exception for this. There are mainly two scope rules static and dynamic. In Java also we follow both the scope rules static and dynamic. In today's lecture we will discuss about static scope rule. Now, let us see a small program here is a class declaration called the class box. Uh, so, this class is you already know that okay, it has the data as well as the method in this case area is the method x, y and w is the another class uh, is a member of this class. Now, let us consider another class here is the circle the circle has data like x, y, r and then another method is called the area. Now, if we consider the two classes namely box and circle then we can see that x, y both member data members are declared as float in both the classes, but the thing is that x, y which is defined in box it has scope within the box class. Similarly, the x y which is defined in the class circle it has the scope only within this class circle. Now, if we write a main program let, let us name this main program as geo class and we declare here the two members the x and y which is declared as a 50 and 60. So, x and y is basically member which belongs to geo class again this x y and the x y in class box or x y in class circle are totally different. Now, here again if we see uh, in this method we create two objects of type box and then circle b and c respectively and then if you see system dot out dot print ln geo class data x this x this x is basically x equals to 50. Similarly, if we call this one b dot x. So, b dot x is basically this x in float. Similarly, b dot area is the area of the method b and like this c dot x is the x of the class c and c dot area is the area of the method c. Now, so with this scope we usually resolve by specifying the name of the object. So, b dot x, c dot x, b dot area, c dot area like. So, this way we can resolve the scope and the scope that we can follow it is called static scope because by seeing the program we can tell that which method or which member has the scope of what. Now, this is the one example of static scope rule another example. Now, let us see another class that we have declared here. So, static scope the name of the class and in this method the in this class we declare one variable x as integer and x is declared as 20. Now, if we see it is declared within this main method that means that this x has the scope of the entire entire method. So, here x is the one class that we have declared it is declared as an integer the scope of this is basically the entire method the main method. On the other hand we have declared another another variable integer y equals to 20 and as it is declared here not here this means that this y has the scope of this this part. So, this scope the y scope of this is this one. So, so the two variables which we have declared has the two different scope x has the scope of the entire whereas, the entire whereas, the y has the scope of this one. Now, so this is basically another example of static scope rule and 
in this case if we see in this case if we see if we can attempt to access y equals to 100 is basically report a compilation error this is because the scope of y is beyond this right. So, y does not have any scope outside this region. So, that is the case of the static scope rule and it is in case of simple variable that we have discussed. Now, so we have learned about the simple scope rule. Now, there are two concepts in Java related to the scope rule, it is called the instance variable and the class variable. Now, let us first discuss about what is the instance variable. Now, let us refer to the concept of class box, we have created two objects say b 1 and b 2. So, b 1 and b 2 are the two objects and the two objects have the two variables uh, three variables x y w. So, if we create b 1 it has instances and this is the one instance corresponding to the object b 1, this is the another instance corresponding to the object b 2. So, there are two instances of the object that we have created. Now, let us consider another instances of another object say class C 1. C 1 is the another objects of class circle, C 2 is another object of class circle again and again here we created the two instances of class circle where x, y, r are the three instances. So, here this is the one instances and this is the another instances of the right. So, whenever we maintain the memory, so basically this x is the separate and this x is the separate. Similarly, this x they are all separate in existence. So, this is the idea about instance variable. Now, so, the, so instance variable we have learned about. So, whenever an object of a particular class is created, we can say the instance variable for that objects are created. Now, so now we will discuss about the static variable declaration. We have mentioned the concept of static while we are discussing about uh, main method declaration. So, public, static, void, main. So, there the static concept was declared that okay, without uh, okay, if we declare a method as static, so this method can be called without creating any object. This is the concept that we have learned about, but the concept of static keyword in Java also has its own implications. Now, we are going to learn about it. So, in Java we know there is no concept of global variable declaration. All the variable that means data that will be declared will be encapsulated in the class but sometimes we can we may require the global variables also. So, Java developer can provide this one by means of static keyword. So, if we declare a variable or a method as a static then such a variable is called class variable or such a method is called class method. Now, we are going to discuss about class variable and class method one by one. So, if we declare a variable as a static that means, if you declare a variable as a class the difference from this class variable to the instance variable is that instance variable has its own local copy whereas, class variable has the global copy that means, for all instances of all objects belong to a class if it is a class variable then it has only one copy whereas, for all variables which are declared as an instance variable they have the different copies. Now, so here is a one example here suppose b 1, b 2, b 3 are the three objects belong to the class box and if we declare w as a static. So, that declaration like say static keyword before this. So, static float w if we declare w as a static right this way then w become the class variable. So, it means that in this example all x y they are the instance variable 
whereas, this w and the are the static variable or class variable this means that it has the for all objects it the only one copy is there. So, that means, it shared w is shared among all three objects uh, that we have created. So, if it is a class variable that is the static variable then it will have only one instance for all classes that means, shareable to all classes. So, this is the idea about the two con uh, the concepts that instance variable versus class variable. Now, let us discuss an example to clear the concept of static variable more understandable way. So, here we discussed one class name of the class is circle here. So, we declare one class circle and we declare one variable here you can note the variable is a circle count and which is declared as a static this variable is declared as a static that means, circle circle count is a is a static variable or class variable in this case. On the other hand uh, here we declare other three variables simple as a public double x y r they are basically instance variable. So, in this in this class example we declare three two types of variable class variable and instance variable. Now, let us these are the as usual we have already familiar to this is a constructor there are many way constructor using the this. So, this is the one constructor which is defined explicitly and these are the constructor which basically defined using the this this means called the super class constructor this constructor using other parameters. So, those are the concept that we have already learned about it. So, this this basically completes the declaration of a class circle. So, this is the class circle that can be initialized uh, an objects or create an object with different parameter that can be passed here. Now, in addition to this this method has the uh, this class has the two more method circumference and area. So, so, this completes the declaration of the class circle. Now, let us come to the declaration of this method uh, public static void main string arcs method. Now, here we declare three objects C 1, C 2 and C 3. Three objects are created. Now, for three objects therefore, so for the instance variable x y are, are concerned they have the three instances separately whereas, for the circle count for all the three objects C 1, C 2 and C 3 it has only one instance. So, this means that if we print the C 1 dot circle count and then C 2 circle count and C 3 circle count for each circle it will give the value as it is basically whenever this is incre increased. So, circle count will be increased when one object is created. So, initially it is 0 when this is created circle count is 1, this is created circle count is 2 and when this is created circle count is 3. So, this C 1 has its circle count 1, C 2 has circle count 2 and C 3 has circle count 3 and at the end of these things the value of the circle count when the all three objects are created is basically 3. So, in this case if we print c 1 dot circle count, c 2 dot circle count, c 3 dot circle count it will print 3 3 3 in all cases. However, if we print the circle count c 1 dot circle count here it will print 1, if we print here then it is print 2 and if we print here it will print 3. So, this basically this is because the circle count being a class variable is the global variable. So, if the value is changed by in any object it will be reflected automatically to the global object. So, this is the one good example of a static variable. Now, uh, let us consider the discussion of we have learned about static variable likewise a method also can be declared as a static method. Now, a method can be declared as a static method if we use is a static keyword again. So, static keyword is used to declare the method for example, here again come to the uh, circle class 
it has instance variable these are the instance variable and this is the one method the constructor uh, this is the one method uh, you call the bigger this bigger takes an input and argument as a circle and return another circle. So, this is the method and here another method you can see this method we have declared again as a bigger, but this method is declared as a st static. Now, these two methods are called overloading, overloading method means this bigger and this bigger although same, but they have the different task and operation because its argument is one circle, its argument two, its code is different than this one. So, these two methods are overloading method. However, in the second overriding method, overloading method that we have discussed here as a static, this means that this is the simple instance method. That means, whenever one object is created, we can call this method for that object. However, if we declare a method as a static, then it is called the class method. That means, this kind of method can be accessed without creating an object. Now, let us see one example in the main method, it can clear your idea when I mean how the two methods instance method and class method is different. So, here is the one example that we can see here. So, we can create a circle, circle and so A, B are the two circles objects are created and then C basically is a another circle object is created, but it will be returned by bigger. Now, you see this bigger method, this bigger is basically the instance method, because in order it is accessed by accessing object. So, A. However, in the next example if you see here this bigger A B is called for this circle class without creating any object. So, this is the idea of the class method, this means that a class method can be invoked without creating any object and that is why our main method is static which belong to this class circle, this is because without creating any object class circle, we can call this method n, main is called without creating any object of the class. So, this is the idea about the uh, static method and so we have discussed about static scope rule and then the class variable and instance variable as a class method and instant method. Now, we will discuss about the nested class in Java program. The nested class means a class can be defined within inside the another class. So, it is called the nested class and in Java there is no limit about how many nesting is there. It can be going and, but nested class is not a good practice because uh, it basically creates a lot of I mean source of many errors are there, but sometimes if we see that this class is only limited to the this part only, then in that part we can discuss that class. So, being define a class as a nested, it is basically very local to either that class or belong to that method or belong to that block. So, nested class concept is okay, it is although rarely used, but it has some in usage in some context. So, let us discuss about the idea of the nested, nested class concept. Again, come to the declaration of class circle that we have discussed here. And here you see uh, the circle class is declared, circle class is declared, and within the circle class, we declare one class call point, we declare this class as static, we can declare simply public class point. If we declare static means it is only one instance for all the circle object that we created, that is why the concept it is there anyway. So, uh, so this is the one point that we have declared within this class. So, this class concept, this declaration, this declaration is the nested declaration and it is the example of nested class. Now, let us see the complete code for this. Here is the complete code and the simple one code is here. So, we declare one method within the class circle. The name of the method that we have declared here is a boolean. 
Boolean method, Boolean is the variable, the name of the method is, is inside and these are the code of this method, very simple code, it basically uh, the method is to decide whether a point inside a circle or on the circle or outside the circle, it is a simple logic that you can follow, it will create the distance from the center of the circle to that point and this distance is less than radius of the circle, then it is inside if it is equal to the radius then it is on and then if it is greater than the radius then it is there. So, this method this concept it is used here. Uh, so, this is the inside method and let us see the uh, main method. The main method creates two objects A is the object of class circle P A is the point and then P A dot display is basically called the display method which is defined in the class itself and then here basically it will check that whether this point P A is inside the circle or not. So, it basically we create another circle B and P B and then we can see we can call whether this point 3 3 is inside the circle or not and here this point P e is inside the circle this circle or not. So, this is the idea about that here the class P is to be local to the circle class. This means that this class point cannot be accessed by any other class either in this file or outside this file. That means, if we use any other program where we can use this class circle, but we cannot use the class point there exclusively. It can be used only the class circle is used like this one. So, class circle class point P class point is totally local to the class circle only. So, it has limited access in that sense. Now, so after uh, knowing the nested programming, nested uh, class concept, the Java also provides us the recursive program. Now, recursion is an important concept and it solves many complex problems very quickly and uh, only the thing that is required is that to solve the problem which needs to be solved using recursion we have to have a very clear definition of the problem itself. Now, let us see how the recursive program can be written in Java, we will consider a simple example. Uh, we know the calculation of factorial, so a factorial n, n factorial will look like this one. So, the factorial n which look like this one. So, n factorial is basically as we know this is the common declaration n factorial is look like this ok and we know that 0 factorial equals to 1. So, it is there. So, this basically is this basically the concept of the factorial and if we write a iterative program using some for loop the calculation of this recursion is not a big job and this this code is basically explain how recursive program, how uh, the calculation of factorial can be done using an iterative program, so using for loop. But the same thing can be done using uh, a recursive program, let us see how the recursion is there. So, the factorial calculation can be de defined recursively using this definition. So, here is the definition of recursion n factorial is equals to n into n minus 1 factorial. It is called the recursive definition because n factorial is defined in terms of n minus 1 factorial. So, it is why that means the same thing is defined by itself. So, that is why the concept of recursive. Now, this definition can be straight away implemented in a recursive program and now here is an example how we can see. Uh, so, here you just let us look at the code. So, we have declared here the one class recursive factorial and then integer n is the data for this class and factorial this is the method which basically will calculate the factorial of any integer n. 
Now, here is the code basically complete codes for calculating the factorial of any integer and if you see n factorial this is the factorial n is equals to n star factorial n minus 1. So, this definition. Now, here also for every recursive program you should consider the termina, termina, termination con, condition. So, is the termination condition is that 0 factorial equals to 1 because this factorial will call a factorial n minus 1 to calculate the factorial n minus 1 it will call the factorial of n minus 2 and so on so on. So, call will go on this way n to n minus 1 to n minus 2 to dot 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 and whenever it will come to 0 it basically return 1. So, no more call of the factorial function is there. So, this is the concept of factorial calculation and here is the basically we create an object. So, x is an object of this class. So, it is basically recursive factorial the object is created and we read an integer value from the common line. So, x dot n is basically the value of the class data x n and then it will basically call the factorial x n as the output it will give you the factorial of n basically. So, this is the idea about factorial calculation if you look this program little bit carefully you will be able to understand. So, this is the idea about now if we practice more recursive program then your a concept of recursion will be good. So, I will just clear few more example another example that this is also good example for uh, to discuss the recursive program writing. Now, the series I have listed here if you see the series then if I ask you what is the next number the next number you can guess that okay, this next number will be uh, 34. So, here if we see any number is basically sum of the previous two numbers. So, this way the recursion is here recursion means here again I just discuss about how the recursion come into the picture here. So, the idea about this and so if I ask you to write a program which will print all the numbers according to this series this series is particularly called the Fibonacci series or Fibonacci sequence and this is the iterative program is very simple loop that loop is basically declared here you can understand that this loop will create this kind of. So, this is an iterative approach of calculating the Fibonacci series. Now, let us see how the same can be done using writing a recursive function. So, in that case you have to understand that how this Fibonacci series can be expressed in a recursive way. Now, so here is basically the recursive definition. So, for the nth Fibonacci number is concerned where n may be 0, 1 whatever it is there. So, so here basically uh, this basically the recursive definition of any nth Fibonacci number. If you see if we have to calculate the nth Fibonacci number it is basically n minus 1 Fibonacci number n minus 2 Fibonacci number sum. Similarly, n minus 1 can be recursively calculated n minus 2 can be recursively calculated. So, this way a recursion can be grown out and and this basically is the termination condition. Now, having this declare uh, definition within us we are now in a position to calculate the recursive version of the Fibonacci series calculation. So, here is the recursion recursive version of the program. Now, let us look the program here we have uh, so this is basically the termination condition. So, this is basically here is the termination condition as we see this is corresponding this one is implemented and this basically Fibonacci n is basically Fibonacci n minus 1 plus Fibonacci n minus 2. So, this way the recursion will be carried out and this is a simple main program which create a which read a value from the keyboard and then calculate its Fibonacci and then print the thing. So, this basically pre, pre, print the entire series of the Fibonacci sequence. 
So, this is the one program that you should practice with your own time, so that you can understand both the recursion program that we have discussed for the factorial as well as Fibonacci you should practice. Now, let us before conclusion let us have one more example uh, this is the GCT calculation GCT stands for greatest common divisor as we see GCT of two numbers integer number rather can be calculated like this. Okay. So, GCT of 113 you know 1 this 8 and 8 is 8 like this one. So, this is the as per the simple definition of GCD. Now, let us see how the same GCD can be defined uh, recursively. So, here is the recursive definition this basically includes the recursive definition of the GCD it is basically same as the same as the this one right almost same this one. So, this basically recursive now if we convert this part if we convert this part into a Java program uh, is a method in a Java program it basically calculates. Now, let us see how the method for the same in Java program will look like. So, this is basically is the uh, method recursive version of the GCT calculation the definition those things that we have discussed here, here it is basically implemented here and then here the recursive version is that if the GCD is basically GCD of this one. So, this 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 concept it is there. So, this way the recursion can be carried out and this is the main method where we just call this recursive method to calculate the recursion for any two integer read from the common line argument from the keyboard. So, this is the idea about the GCD calculation and uh, so we have discussed about few example of GCD calculation. Now, let us consider another simple program can you guess it although it will take some time right may be 30 seconds you can think about. So, what this code will give give a results if you think it then you can understand that recursion is little bit understandable to you. Anyway, if you run this program with your own machine and then it will you will see that it will give this kind of output can you explain why this uh, output for this program. So, if you know the recursion then you will be able to explain these things very carefully. Anyway, so this is about the concept of static scope rule in Java we have discussed about and they, then in our next lecture we will learn about information hiding this is very important concepts and then also we should learn about how a very big Java program can be developed. So, these are the next topics that we will be covered in the next discussion and thank you very much.